Here today we have JJ Domino hailing from Massachusetts. He is an avid reader and skier, and today he will be telling us about the global perspective. Thank you, JJ. If I were to challenge you to peel an orange so that the leftover peel was flat and rectangular without any excess peel, you'd quickly learn that that was impossible. You could certainly create a lot of shapes with the peel, but nothing close to our goal. So say if you were to draw on the orange, perhaps a map of the world. To preserve the map while you peel the orange, either the oceans have to be split, land needs to be oriented oddly, or the map has to be disregarded in its entirety, but you can create some cool shapes like a star. An orange peel turned flat, similarly to a globe turned into a map, cannot be made flat without deforming it or ripping it up. Therefore, to create those pleasant rectangular maps that we are all used to, something has to give and elements will be disoriented. Take, take the classic Mercator map, loved and used by all, but for no good reason. The map was created for marine navigation and has no practical use for us modern land dwellers. It's perfect for sailing because you can plot a straight route, straight route on the map and be able to sail in a single direction until you reach your destination. However, for us, it's not very useful. In order to preserve the latitude and longitude like all cylindrical projections, other factors need to be sacrificed, namely area and distance. So while everything looks pretty, in reality, what we care about most is distorted. Look at how Africa and Greenland look comparable, or even Alaska and Australia. Places that look the same size on the Mercator map projection are wildly different in reality. Due to the innovations of Gerdatus Mercator, it sim he simplified navigation and the map gained notoriety. However, as trade routes spread the map and it became the default map projection for society, it had some consequences. It is theorized by sociologists that the projection minimizes the landmass of equatorial developing nations, furthering imperialism and colonialism by the global north. Further, people develop misconceptions of the land size and can form distorted cognitive maps in their minds. So what are we waiting for? The time has come to disregard the Mercator. However, this is not a revolutionary idea. This is in fact a quote from the New York Times over 80 years ago. There are so many diverse and interesting map projections each of us can use. A map projection generally has about five qualities. There's area, shape, direction, bearing, and distance. As such, there are different map projection categories which forgo some of those qualities. There are cylindrical maps like the Mercator, which preserve angles. There are equal area maps, which preserve measure and there are equidistant maps which preserve distance. While these examples can be untraditional, there are also beautiful map projections like the Winkle Triple. It has been National Geographic's default choice for over two decades, and it's also my personal favorite, and I'm sure one of those endorsements mean more to you than the other. Each of these, just like the classic Mercator map projection, has their specific use, fault, and purpose. For most casual onlookers, shape and relative size is important. But for ocean floor explorers, cartographers, geography teachers, they all have dramatically different needs. No matter which lens you choose, something will have to compromise. However, by looking at all the different projections, your viewpoint is guaranteed to be more accurate and full. So next time you're confronted with a disagreement or a problem, it may help to look at the situation from a brand new perspective. Don't be afraid to turn your vantage point upside down too, because you may end up seeing the world from a totally new perspective. Thank you. Now we have Carson Grimm, who is a sophomore at AU. She's double majoring in sociology and PR, which is pretty impressive. She comes originally from Jacksonville, Florida, where she spent the first 18 years of her life living and calling it home. And today she's going to tell you about how to make a home out of anywhere you go. Thank you. For the past three years, I didn't have a home, or well, I thought I didn't have a home. After my parents got divorced when I was 16, I moved a total of seven times in a two year span. That is eight houses in two years. So I gave up unpacking at each house, living out of boxes and suitcases, not knowing if the next one would finally be it. In that two year span anyways, as a dramatic teenager going through a tough transition, 
My family, the people that once were my home, were what now felt like my biggest betrayal. So I did what any normal teenager trying to live out their own coming of age movie would do, find a new home, basically living out of my car as I drove two hours north to Savannah, Georgia in the middle of school nights only to impressively make it to my 8 a.m. first period the next day, or living at my childhood best friend's house when I just didn't feel like going back. After my fifth, after my mom's fifth try and my dad's third try at a rental house, and I finally decided to stop running, it was time for me to move halfway up the coast to DC for college. I had no sense of place. Psychologist Dana Prince wrote an entire study on identity research and youth identity development. She said, place-based experiences such as belonging, aversion, and entrapment may be internalized and encoded into possible selves, thus producing an emplaced future self-concept. Basically, humans, especially teenagers, naturally crave a sense of belonging and having a sense of place, or rather that constant reassuring geographic place of belonging is the most natural and immediate way that they can get that. However, it's hard to get that when every few months you come home from school and all of a sudden there's a realtor in your house asking to speak to your mom, or on those days that you really just don't feel like returning to the mess of home, you sit in your car in a Chick-fil-A parking lot for hours on end. Now, I know everyone in this room has had to find a new home at least once in their life. After all, we're all here for college, whether it was 20 minutes away from our house or halfway across the world. And it can be hard. How do you go from finding comfort and stability in the same place for so many years to having to adapt to an entirely new, unique environment? How do you find home in a small dorm or an overpriced apartment or in the culture shock environment that is a small overpriced university in Washington, DC? And that's when I realized, and it took me a while. It took me through the whole transitional period of freshman year and through the dread of having to go back to my physical house for breaks. And it wasn't until I was preparing to move in to live with a family I had never met before in New York City that it occurred to me. Home isn't just your house. Maybe it's a place you find comfort, or maybe it's a person, or maybe it's an experience you have. Home is your brother when you FaceTime him in the middle of the night to complain about life, or home is your childhood best friend's family when they offer to take you in. Home is driving through your city at night with music blasting when you just can't quite bring yourself to return to that physical house. Home is riding the carousel 50 times in a row almost every day with the girl you nanny. When I didn't have a physical home and I was running away from the idea of it, it just made me realize that you can find home in the little things and the smaller senses of comfort. And from there, you can find that larger sense of belonging, comfort, and independence. When people are asked to define home, it's usually related to the place they live. But home is not always a constant like that. And once you figure that out, you can find a little bit of home wherever you go. Thank you. Tonight, we have Mira Segal with us from Fremont, California. She is going to talk to you today about making the mirror. She is a Clegg major at AU, and we'll give it up for Mira. It was a Tuesday night and I had been going through a rough time. Upset because I cared too much about too many different things. School, what people thought of me, and I just found it all catching up to me at once. Sitting in the bathroom where I just excused myself to take a break, I noticed a hand dryer next to me. It had a label on it printed with some information from a manufacturer about use. I questioned why some things like this were absolutely meaningless to me. I really could not care less. Well, here I was upset in knots because I cared too much about so much else. So what makes something arbitrary and what makes something important? The answer is whether or not it evokes an emotion. As human beings, we spend our lives chasing a feeling. We chase what brings us happiness, sadness, laughter, or joy, and spend the majority of our lives trying to control it. But here lies a big mistake and the problem I found myself in that night trying to look outside for something that we can only really find on the inside. Because every feeling or emotion can only be generated by us and experienced inside of us. So all the money in the world might not make you feel rich and safe, 
and you can easily feel unloved in the best relationship of your life. Chasing feelings from outside will do very little unless you cultivate them inside of you first. The fact that I never noticed something that I didn't have an emotion attached to proves that what you focus on expands. And if what you focus on expands, then what you focus on quite literally becomes your world. Your internal emotional experiences then can't really be separated from the way you perceive reality. But here you have the power, the power to become a mirror. Our experiences tend to conform to our existing beliefs. If you think the world is a bad place, you're more likely to have experiences that conform to that belief because your subconscious mind always wants to be proven correct. I think that if you go looking for the bad in a situation, you're definitely a lot more likely to find it. Our lives are a product of the stories we tell ourselves. The stories we tell about the world are important, but more important are the stories we tell ourselves about who we are. But how much of those stories were told to us growing up or influenced by the people around us and how many of those stories are really decided by us. Here you have the power to rewrite that story. Becoming the mirror has the power to change your life. So where do you start? Reframe your internal dialogue. Reorient yourself towards positivity. Laugh, give back, and express gratitude, even for all that you might think is bad in your life. Studies have shown that it's impossible to feel grateful and feel sad at the same time. Find what makes you feel good and do more of that. Because life is a mirror, only you hold the key. You hold the key to create an internal landscape and make it as positive as you possibly can to see that reflected back to you. She is a sophomore Clegg major at AU and an avid reader. You can often find her curled up with her favorite book. Thank you, Mackenzie. Thank you, Josie. <laughs> Have you ever thrown a book out the window? Have you ever felt that passion that accompanies reaching the ending of your favorite book? Either way, one thing is for sure, the way that we read has changed. A response I often get when I ask my peers if they like reading is, ew, I hate reading. Being so against something that is so fundamental to society has always intrigued me, and often I'm not sure how to respond. To me, being against reading is truly unbelievable. I honestly can't imagine my life without my favorite book or my favorite characters. To others, and to me, we grew up in a public school system that forced us to read Great Expectations and Shakespeare. So who can really blame them for not liking reading? Some people just never grew a love for, them, for it, and that's okay, because we all have our different interests and passions. The first book that I ever read was Make Way for Ducklings, a beloved Boston tradition. And ever since that moment, I was hooked. I loved being able to absorb myself into an entirely different world completely. But today, in the 21st century, reading is, no, not only the, reading is not only the only tool that can be used for escape. We are sur constantly surrounded by information. We have TV, phones in our pockets, and social media. So we can't fault those for not loving reading. Trust me, I am just as addicted to social media as anyone else in this audience. This divide, however, has led to a divide in skill sets and a decline in critical reading and writing skills. Reading helps us writers develop our own writing style and can even help us work through writer's block. One of my favorite quotes by Stephen King reads, if you don't have the time to read, you don't have the time or the tools to write. So while it has been proven that reading increases your writing skills, some people like to argue that the only way to do this is by reading books but I'm here to argue the opposite. Our attention spans have grown shorter have, have grown shorter today and reading is no longer the sole vessel used for entertainment as it was 100 years ago. I don't know about you guys in the audience, but the last thing I wanna do after a long day at work when my brain has already been turned into mush from the workday is to sit down and read a book critically. So we know that the way that we read has changed. We look at the news in the morning on our phones, we, we're in constant communication over text with our friends and family. We read notifications that pop up on our phones, and we even read the subtitles of our favorite show. All of this is reading. We're just not reading it critically. When I'm reading a news article and I don't know a word that comes up, I will hardly ever take the time or the effort to look up that word and find out its meaning. But when I'm reading a book, I do take that extra step. 
I will take the time to look up that word and find its meaning, and I'll even go as far to write its meaning, meaning down in the margin. And I will try and, try and incorporate that word into my next writing piece. So the problem is that we're not, is that, the problem isn't that we're not reading anymore. The problem is that we usually don't have the time, energy, or the even want to put in the effort to read critically. So here's what I propose. I encourage all of you in the audience to start reading critically. Whether that be a news article that you're reading in the morning and you don't know a word, take that extra step to look it up and find out its meaning and learn from it. Whether you're texting with friends and family, compare their writing styles and see how they differ and learn from it and use it in your next writing piece. And as you guys all embark on this critical reading journey, I will be there right alongside you, teaching myself how to read critically in a world where we all have computers in our pockets. She's very excited to tell us about her unique viewpoint on the world, scratching beyond the surface, not boring in the slightest, but very full of color. Please join me in welcoming Avani. Color, something that we all see on our clothes, on our skin, and even in our souls. Color, one of the first things that people recognize about us. Are you wearing a blue dress like me or a blue shirt like her? What shade is it and how does it make you feel? Growing up, I saw color differently than everybody else. It wasn't your favorite color and what you wore, but it was more of how you made me feel. Did you make me feel vibrant or mellow? Did you make me feel light or dark? And there's always a reason for how I saw you. There's a scientific reason for this called synesthesia, which is when one sensory or cognitive pathway leads it to involuntary experiences in another sensory or cognitive pathway. Very scientific, I know. And I don't feel like this. For me, it's more of a natural thing. I could choose when I want to do it. And it just helps me organize people. Our first color is red. The first color of the rainbow and a dark color in my head. Red reminds me of good things that I love, like strawberries and apples, but it also reminds me of fury and fire. In my brain, you have goods and bads. You're confident and powerful, but it comes into play when I talk about the different shades. Lighter red means you're less intimidating to me. You have a lighter heart and you're easier for me to talk to, but with a hint of heat. Darker red meaning that you're confident, sure of yourself. You make me feel overpowered, but I don't consider you a threat. Orange, mellow, but still vibrant. Some of the people I like to consider cool, calm, and collected, but exude a lot of energy. They are attractive and people like them with their outgoing demeanor. They uplift and spread positivity. And these are the people I consider to be closest friends with. People who make me happy and giddy, make me smile and feel good. Lighter orange for those who are especially outgoing and dark orange for those who I think I have a special bond with, almost a richer bond. Yellow, the color of the sun, moon, and the stars. The color of things I love, like lemonade and bananas, and a color that brightens your day. This color goes to strangers, usually in passing, those who smile at me or compliment me for the day, and the people who I see do good, like leave a tip or help out the homeless. These are people who I find to have pure souls, and I just want to better others. As I said, they're usually passer buyers for me, but they're people I'm trying to incorporate more in my everyday life. Light yellow for those who do more good deeds and dark yellow for those who do more kind deeds. Green, vegetables, grass, grapes, and trees. People who love the outdoors and going on adventures and people who motivate me to go. People of authority mostly go in the green category for me. Those include teachers and tutors, people higher than me. Green represents go, and that's exactly what they make me do. Blue, those who are far enough from my outer circle of orange, but people who I still consider friends. They fill my life with goodness, but I don't know much about them. I don't know their usual first name, last name, and where they're from, but I don't know the real them. For me, this is usually college friends or people who I just begin to meet. And I don't know their personality outside of those little highs and buys that we exchange. Sky blue for those who I don't really know much about, but for royal blue, I do. Those who I spend the time to stop and talk to and even hug. Purple, 
my family members, and the people of my family. A calm color that brings me happiness and joy. A calm color that reminds me of lavender, like the perfume my mom wears, and blackberries, my dad's favorite fruit. Lighter as we get more distant in my family and darker as we get to my mom, my brother, and my dad. Everyone has a place for me, a color in which they belong and a category in which they stay. They make sense to me and I hope they make sense to you too. I leave you with the question of what color you are and what color you want to be. Well, how do you want the world to perceive you and how do you perceive yourself? Thank you. She came to AU as a Clegg major here. She is the oldest of three triplets, well, obviously three as in triplet, and she is very proudly left-handed. She plans to go on to sell her soul to corporate America as a lawyer after her time at AU. So let's give it up for Hannah. When I was three years old, my mom died of brain cancer. Now, this sentence could lead me into a soft story about my life, how I overcame such a big struggle. However, I never lived my life that way, and I don't think it would be very productive talk for you all to listen to. Instead, I'm going to attempt to give some pointers to anybody else going through a loss, and maybe teach anybody not experiencing this something else along the way. So, here it is. My survival guide to growing up with a dead parent. Number one, be prepared to explain a lot. People are going to ask questions and have a multitude of responses. In my case, the most common response is, I'm sorry to hear that. Learn how to respond, but also know that a lot of people aren't going to ask how you're doing. The conversation will most likely end there. However, if you're on a date and it comes up and the other person stays silent and says nothing, you should probably take that as a red flag, just a personal anecdote and some foreshadowing that that potential relationship was not going to work out. <laughs> Number two, your loss doesn't mean that your life has to be a solved story. Obviously, growing up with a dead parent is awful. I know, because I've been there. Some days are harder than others. However, it doesn't define who you are. And it doesn't mean your whole life is about that one moment. Number three, a critical part of your life is taboo for most people. Nobody likes to talk about death. Many parents shelter their children from it for as long as possible. However, in a situation like mine, or like many other children who face the same fate of the harsh reality of death early on, it can be quite isolating to not be able to talk about it with any of your friends. And as someone who uses humor as a coping mechanism, it leads to silence in some of my closest friends who still aren't comfortable talking about it with me. As you can imagine, I've made many of rooms uncomfortable and very, very silent with my responses to your mom jokes. <laughs> Therefore, as straightforward as this sounds, I would suggest therapy right away. Having someone to talk to who's trained to help you through the situation that you are in is one of the best ways to cope. But if you are comfortable with it, explain to friends that they don't have to tip a row, tiptoe around your situation. Tip number four, gender differences are real. Growing up with a single dad, I learned a lot about growing up as a girl alone. I didn't have a mom with me to go prom dress shopping, and I had no one to show me how to put on makeup or do my hair the right way. If this is your situation, YouTube is your best friend. You can also lean on your friend's parents like you would your own. Go to older cousins, um, aunts, uncles, if you don't feel comfortable talking to your other parent. Number five, find somebody else to fill in. Whether it's needing someone to make your costume for the third grade play because everyone else's moms are making them, or not having a parent come in for bring your parent to school day, find someone else like an aunt or grandparent to help. And a word of advice for schools, change your wording to be more inclusive. Instead of making students feel left out for not having a parent available to come for whatever reason, make it bring a guardian or bring a family member to school day without specifying who it should be. And finally, number six, it doesn't have to get better, you just learn to live with it. As someone who has lived with a dead mom for 16 years, take it from me that every situation is different, but learning to live with it doesn't mean forgetting. As you grow up, have your first day of school, find your passions and hobbies, go through your awkward middle school years, graduate high school, move into college, 
spend your first birthday apart and come home for that first summer and go on to live the rest of your lives. You miss your parent who didn't get to be there every step of the way, but that makes the family or friends who were there even more special. And more importantly, you realize more and more that every day you will be okay. Thank you. Natalie is a third year CLEG student at American University. She hopes to go on to law school after this. During her free time, which she doesn't have a lot of, she enjoys cooking, reading at the beach, and watching movies. So let's give it up for Natalie. How many of you at some point today drink coffee? All right, now think to yourself, did you drink that coffee to savor and enjoy it, perhaps sharing it with a friend? Or did you sleepily down that coffee first thing in the morning and try to start your day? In 2022, roughly 74% of American adults consume some form of coffee every day, with the average coffee consumer drinking two or more cups daily. Coffee is not new. It was first discovered in ancient Ethiopia, and it later reached Europe in the 17th century. Now, coffee is the largest, second largest commodity in the world, only following crude oil. In Europe today, cafes sprinkle old cities and people sit down to drink their cappuccinos with a friend or a newspaper. The Italians, for example, drink coffee simply to enjoy the flavor of the beans. Coffee has also become a large part of American culture, but in a vastly different way. Americans down their coffee in hopes of boosting their energy and productivity. Sure, there are Americans out there who like to sit down and savor their coffee, but most Americans choose the drink because it meshes well with America's on-the-go, work-obsessed culture. If you want to keep up in certain work environments, you practically need a performance enhancer like coffee. The largest coffee chain in the world, Starbucks, has over 15,000 stores in the U.S. Washington, D.C., for example, where we are now, which is only 68 square miles, has 91 Starbucks locations. That's at least 1.3 Starbucks per square mile. And, you know, Starbucks offers seating inside, but most people don't use it. They need to get their coffee and go. And those who do use it kind of are only there to work, grinding with their laptops open. There is, they, the coffee is not, is not really enjoyed anymore. You know, we're working and we're drinking our coffee and it goes hand in hand. Especially in a bustling city where people are headed to work and school almost every single day, many people simply can't survive without their daily fix of coffee. It's become America's IV, a human gasoline we need to function at the rate we're going. But is drinking coffee really that bad? Well, there are actually some health benefits to drinking coffee. According to John Hopkins University, various studies have linked caffeine intake to a decreased risk of heart disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes, Parkinson's disease, liver and colon cancers, and depression. So maybe drinking coffee isn't so bad. Uh, but there are some negatives, of course. Research relates caffeine intake to jitteriness, headaches, and nervousness. But the big kicker is coffee's impact on sleep. So the Sleep Foundation reports that coffee can make you fall asleep later, sleep fewer hours overall, and make your sleep feel less satisfying. When you don't get enough sleep, you wake up the next morning and you drink some coffee to make up for the lack of energy. But then the next night, you don't sleep very well again because of the coffee and a cycle ensues that's quite difficult to break. So coffee has its pros and cons, but if you're only drinking coffee to play catch up at work and function properly, maybe we should step back and reevaluate. Why can't so many of us thrive at work without coffee? Perhaps we are working too much. Author and Harvard professor Michael Pollan wrote, coffee freed us from the circadian rhythms of our body helping to stem the natural tides of exhaustion so that we might work longer and later hours. But working longer and later doesn't necessarily mean that we're being more productive. Perhaps when we put forth our best well-rested selves, we can perform much better than if we were jittery, overtired, and nervous through the coffee. I leave you with a question to ponder. If we could not collectively, as a society, work the way we do without our precious coffee, should we be working this way?